So welcome also from my side. Uh, so today we have the opening session of Peace uh, Research Colloquium. I'm very honored to have uh, here uh, uh, the author of the book that uh, we are present today, the Transitional Justice uh, for Foxes, Conflict, Pluralism and Politics of Compromise. And this session is going to have a bit of an unstandard uh, format that is going to be a conversation with the author. Uh, and uh, Frank is going to have his conversation with uh, Thomas Unger, who is uh, also an associate expert to the dealing with the past program at Swiss Peace. And I'll take a couple of words just to introduce the speaker, the, uh, another second speaker, and also the discussant of today's uh, colloquium. So Frank uh, Haldeman is affiliated researcher at the Interdisciplinary Institute of Ethics and Human Rights at the University of Fribourg. Uh, his PhD is in law uh, from the University of Sydney, and he's been an SNSF professor at the law faculty of the University of Geneva. There they uh, co-directed, Thomas and Frank, they co-directed a master's program in transitional justice, human rights, and the rule of law at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. So he's the author of this book that came out just very recently at Cambridge University Press. And it had gets very good. Uh, uh, it's very acknowledged, and we got very positive Thank reviews you. of the books. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's also co-editor, together with Thomas Unger, of the United Nations Principles to Combat Impunity: A Commentary, which also came out at Oxford University Press in 2018. Let me then shortly also introduce uh, Thomas. Thomas Unger, he's an independent expert of transitional justice, and he's worked with many international organizations, uh, mainly the, uh, doing uh, consultancies on uh, transitional justice matters, uh, so including United Nations, EU, and also Swiss Foreign Ministry. Uh, he has extensive knowledge of work, working with civil society organizations like victims uh, and survivors groups. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they co-directed the master's program. Uh, he was also a former senior advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion of truth, justice, reparation, and guarantees of non-recurrence. Um, then uh, after we have this first discussion with the author for the first half an hour, then we'll uh, have a discussion by an invited uh, expert from the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, Monica uh, Nifele. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, she works at the task force on dealing with the past and prevention of atrocities. And they already all know each other and they've also been working with our dealing with the past program, who also um, uh, initiated this whole conversation uh, by Lisa Ott. She uh, started this, she thought this would be a good idea to bring it here and forward. So I'll just give the floor now to Frank and Thomas. You have now around half an hour and then we'll continue the discussion. So Welcome. <laughs> Look at that. of us to to thank the, uh, the the university and also Swiss Peace for for having us. I think it's a, it's a nice way to, to have a conversation about this book by Frank Haldeman, Traditional Justice for Foxes. I have this uh, beautiful book here with a beautiful picture, and we we see a fox here, and we will speak a little bit about why the fox is in the picture of Transitional Justice. Um, and Frank in his book, and those who have read it or have uh, looked at it or have read parts of it, um, basically one message of the book is that it's an opener for, for a conversation. Um, and so we thought, I mean, we will break the rules. Uh, we don't do a classical kind of, Frank said, we don't do a classical kind of uh, uh, lecture, but we do sort of a conversation. And this is also how both of us we met in a conversation. We talked many years about transitional justice and we continue to do so. I mean, we just came three hours from Geneva and so we actually discussed the book back and forth, but many other things. And so we are good at having a conversation and we thought, why not having a conversation with you? And so um, we will, through that conversation, get to know the book, get to know Frank a little bit more, why he does it this book or why he did this book, um, what interested him and what question interested him, uh, uh, what question was he following with this book? Um, and then also what is his thinking? What is his contribution? Uh, why is he doing this contribution to the field? Why does he see the need to have a different thinking around transitional justice um, that is more based in pluralism 
So we will touch upon these issues in a conversational style, um, and I hope this will be interesting, and this will be followed, I think, by some views um, uh, from, um, from our discussant here, and then I think we will open it up to, to, the, to, to, to you and have a discussion with, with all of you here. But let's jump right in. Um, uh, I mean, the book is really interesting, and it, it hits you from the, from the start. You would think, I don't know, Frank would start off with, I don't know, explaining a case in Colombia, or explaining the case of Northern Ireland or Tunisia, but he starts with Switzerland. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, if you read the preface and thinking about, yeah, why did you start with Switzerland and what, what was the reason you started with Switzerland in your book? Yeah, um, might, might look like a, an unlikely starting point for such a book, but I actually started with a case, the Joseph Spring case, which um, was quite in the limelight in the, in the 80s, in the 90s, 98 as a case which involved uh, a Jewish, a Jewish um, uh, refugee who tried to escape into Switzerland during the Second World War. Those were also the years of the Berger Commission, much talking in Switzerland about the Second World War. And Joseph Spring um, you know, uh, thanked for reparations because he tried, as I said, to escape from France to not so compact France to Switzerland together with his um, cousins. He was 16 years old at the time. The other two cousins were 14 and 21 years old, and they tried to escape, and they were caught the first time at the, in Curie, in those regions, they were sent back, and the second time they were actually caught again and were handed over directly to the Germans. But not only that, also their passports, not only the fake passports were given to the authorities, but also their J-stamp passports, which meant for Joseph Spring that he was sent directly to the internment camp in Dancy. And Dancy, and later on to Auschwitz, he survived miraculously, miraculously and came back in nine, 55 years later with a claim for reparation. And he um, brought that claim to the Swiss Council, to its government. His claim was rejected by the Swiss government in a very tiny, in a very thin um, decision, three against four votes. And after that, he took his case to, um, to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court again confirmed uh, the negative decision by the Swiss government. At the time I was at the Berger Commission, I was, uh, was my first job. I was much younger, <laughs> enthusiastic. And we, we talked about this case and I decided in my personal um, personal capacity to write something about this case, and I, I wrote a very, you know, angry critique against the, 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 the decision of the Supreme Court saying that this was the wrong decision that, and I still think it was, saying that the, the court uh, prioritized wrongly a right to forget, a procedural right to forget or a right to, to remember, and uh, I still think so. But why did I, did I, why did I uh, use this case? For two reasons. First, because thinking about this case now, I wonder whether, you know, my focus is not too narrow. I focus on the law, thinking that, you know, the law, uh, believing that the power of law to solve very large social issues. That was a very legal perspective. And, and, I, and then I wonder, and this is actually a bit of response to this, can the law, can such a narrow perspective actually, is that really the case? Shouldn't we think, you know, more broadly? And the other, and that will bring me to the, the box, and the other was um, starting with such a case, which normally, you know, normally think of transitional justice as something, you know, linked to uh, the global south, atrocities happening there, and we, you know, transitional justice being about the global south, and actually, Realizing that you know radical evil, as you might call it, um, on Hanar and can happen everywhere, and that actually transitional justice sounds very technical, but after all, it's just about how societies deal with the evil past, you know, and um, how they can do this and can happen everywhere in settled, <clears throat> very apparently uh, secure democracy and other places. And I mean, it's interesting when you when one reads your book, you bring back always the normal model. That's, that's how it's called in, in your book, and it's the, the classical model we all know about transitional justice. It's a four pillar structure of transitional justice. So after serious human rights violation, one prosecutes, one provides some reparation, one 
one looks into the truth, uh, one ensures or puts guarantees in place that, that this shouldn't happen again. And you critique this model in a way, and you also critique it from a pluralist point of view, and you use uh, a certain, yeah, you use animals to explain this. <laughs> you use the fox, I mean, the, the book is also called Transitional Justice for Foxes, but there is also a counterpart. And if you could explain a little bit, how do you, how, how did you get into your pluralist thinking about transitional justice? Yeah, so the book is not about wildlife, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's about uh, politics and uh, the form, the, the, the picture of the fox and the hedgehog is actually uh, quite used now in political philosophy and was introduced made, made famous i think by isaiah berlin the philosopher oxford philosopher who used this um by going back to an ancient fragment which says the fox knows many things an ancient Greek fragment the, the fox knows many things but the hedgehog knows one thing and from there uh, <laughs> Uh, Berlin, you know, when he was a student, started dividing people into boxes and hedgehogs, saying, "Yeah, oh, this one is a hedgehog." You see, so, and he uh, he used this idea later in a very in an important article, a well-known article on um, Tolstoy, where he tried to figure out who Leon you know, Tolstoy is. He a fox or is he a hedgehog? And he is a in in at the beginning of the article, the essay, he um, he tries to explain what the difference is, and he says foxes or uh, hedgehogs. Are people who um, you know try to understand any, every, everything in terms of a framework, mm -hmm. in terms of one single system, in terms of one single idea, mm -hmm. and they think that in terms of it, by you know using that that framework they will find the answers. Mm -hmm. Foxes are very different; they move at different levels, and they're always asking, "Am I in the right place? You know, shouldn't I look at it from another perspective, mm -hmm. perhaps?" And so the fox really knows many things in you know? it. And the hedgehog knows one thing. And you know, I came along this this quote, strange quote, not thinking much. I was in New York at the time, it was 2005. I had a postdoc scholarship. I was very convinced that I would actually work on a normative framework for transitional justice because I felt there was something missing. We need the aims, the means of transitional justice. And then I came along this, this article, this essay by Berlin, a very late essay, which is called The Pursuit of the Ideal. And I read it and I was immediately taken away. And it changed my whole perspective on transitional justice. Not immediately, but in the hindsight, I think I moved there. Then we, you know, we did things together and more and more I moved into this direction. And I think Berlin was very important. Yeah. And what disturbs you about that more and more? <laughs> what is it? Why did you feel that it needs a pluralist uh, perspective? I think it was... Um, the more and more thinking about cases, you know, mm -hmm. I was very much I, after New York, I went to South Africa and, and The Hague. And, and South Africa is very much at the time when, when I started thinking about transitions, is very much in the center of uh, mm -hmm. transitional justice. And it was always linked to the Truth Commission. So the Truth Commission was represented as a little bit, the, you know, the ultimate answer, as, as Berlin would say. And I, the more I studied the case, the more I, I realized that actually South Africa, the South African transition was very much about compromise. It was about a very difficult situation where ANC Mandela came out of prison. Mm -hmm. the, the The country was on the edge of a of a, of a civil war, uh, very bloody. Most most bloody period of the whole apartheid period was after 1990. And having people like Mandela and Joe Slovo, we'll perhaps talk about him later, mm -hmm. saying we need to make compromises with the regime because the regime. It's just too strong. We will never you know, be able to, to defeat the, the, the regime in a military way. We need to find compromises. And from there, I thought about other cases, Colombia later on, um, uh, Northern Ireland, and so many other cases, even Tunisia, where you see that compromises play such an important role. Mm -hmm. And where you see that the anti-impunity framework is very important, of course, because it speaks the language of the victims. And just to be clear on this, this is not the book against the normal model. It's not the book against the anti-impunity framework. It's, a, an, in, it's an internal critique. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to work from within that framework. I, I know where I come from. You know? <laughs> but I, I just, at some stage, I, I had the impression that that framework doesn't help us with understanding mm -hmm. what it means to, to move out from such conflict. And, uh, and you talk a lot about um, 
uh, one problem is that the normal framework doesn't think about conflict, political conflict, <laughs> economical conflict, like conflicts that take place in a society, and it doesn't really take a stance on that. It, it, it kind of leaves them out. It makes them look even invisible. Right. Uh, what are these conflicts? Why, why, why do you think they're they are relevant also for, for the field of traditional trust? So perhaps to, just to take a step back. Um, so Berlin, he criticizes what he calls monism. Uh, monism for him is the idea, the hedgehog idea, that somehow well, Kantians think that, or utilitarians, think that there's sort of one law or one, one rule or one idea which helps us to solve everything. Right? And if you have that framework, you will not have conflict because you think with a Kantian idea of you know, categorical imperative, you think this is how we should do things. You will not have space for doubt. You won't have space for compromises, conflicts, um, uh, doubts. You know, it's, it's all is in the system. Right? With pluralism, you start accepting the idea that in the most difficult decisions in our lives, and political decisions even more, you have to make you have to you have to make hard choices. And making hard choices means always that something is lost. That you have different values. You know, we talk a lot in transitional justice and peace studies about peace versus justice. And I think I don't think that this conflict is overrated. I think it's real. That conflict, justice versus versus peace, for instance, is a real conflict. And the question then is, is either we accept that and we think about what is at stake. We think about what are the values which are actually confronting each other, or we just say, well, there's nothing, you know, we, we, have, we have the answer to that. And I think this, this and, and then you get into, that's what I did in my work, is I dedicate quite a lot to, um, political realism, which is a, a theory which is in a, over the last year has become more and more, um, I think, um, is more and more discussed. And it's, it's a response to people like John Rawls or Habermas who, or Ronald Walkin, who have a very idealized um, view of, of political life. And those people say, and it's very important not to get them wrong. Uh, they don't say you have to be cynical about uh, the society. We have to be, uh, you know, there's no place for ideals. What they say is we need to accept the reality of conflict, for instance, value conflict. Mm -hmm. And from there, we have to move out and we have to find answers which are least worst answers to, to dilemmas we might face, mm -hmm. you know. And that's a very different language from the language of, um, Sort of, um, sort of, that's the right approach. You know, mm -hmm. it's rather working with dilemmas, accepting them, mm -hmm. and then trying to find the way out. And then you have to develop a wholly different language. And I think that language is important to complete the normal model, as I call it. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. how did you just as a as a as a footnote question, yeah. so yeah. to say, how did you deal with with the question of language and sharing this knowledge in 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 your book? Because it's it's often, I mean, the criticism uh, of, of pluralist ideas is everything goes basically. Yes. Well, how do you how do you phrase something like this? How do you formulate something like this? How do you find your language around this? What what did you yeah. how did you approach that? So I, I think what I um, so I think language is actually central. You know how we talk about these things huh, is. Um, you can either talk about those things in an either way, you know, or you can uh, you can say um, we accept that we are you know somehow we might be in the wrong you know so it's a fallibilistic approach I call this a fallibilistic mentality and it's linked to pragmatists like um, John Dewey people like that who really think that you know somehow to deal with problems um, you take the experimental approach you accept that there's a system you can work with that but it's never you can never be sure that you there might not be a problem with it. So the possibility that you might be in the wrong means a certain kind of humility, which perhaps might be missing when you take a very normative stance. When you, you know, I, I, I love the Velasco Rodriguez case. I love the, the idea behind, I love, but sometimes I feel that it has a very strict language. Sorry, I'm gonna have a little bit of a cold. <laughs> Had to happen today, of course. Uh, uh, no, uh, so you 
you you have this very uh, you know normative language of how things should be done, which perhaps doesn't really capture you know really the dilemmas people are, are dealing with. You know the sacrifices which have to be made. Think think of we will talk about maybe the South African case a little bit more. Think of of, of Mandela. I mean a, a person who has suffered personally the most terrible things and which is who at a certain stage just you know argues for um saying we need to find a way out here i'm even ready to 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 uh, to have a conversation about amnesties i'm even ready to have a conversation about guaranteeing positions to people who were in that region before and he speak another language that the person is speaking uh, the language of uh, strict obligations and rights even though that language is very important because that language actually puts the boundaries mm -hmm. you know when we talk about compromise and we will talk about and it's a very important part of my book once you talk about compromises you have always to talk about limits because compromises are an ambivalent co project and let's talk about compromise <laughs> we, we need to, to move to 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 the the practical stuff now, this, this, because, because the thing is what's interesting obviously in your book is is that you say we need to move on no somehow we need to to kind of move move forward and compromise is a way to move forward but it's difficult to 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 get this sometimes no yeah. like if you think about the situation like ukraine now or just think about yeah. you know back then apartheid regime where basically you have one group that is dehumanized and how will you how is it compromised at all possible yeah. no yeah. uh so so as as someone who calls for compromise yeah. You might be mm. actually called a traitor or, or someone who betrays a, a, a cause. So how do you, like with an art, how do you make an mm -hmm. argument here? Mm -hmm. How do you mm. approach this? It would be interesting how you did that in your book. Yes. Uh, um, I mean, in a, in a field like transitional justice, which is very much, which is very much um, shaped by you know, human rights movements, people struggling against regime. In that in that field, of course, um, talking about compromise that sound, may, sound, may sound like a betrayal. You know, uh, you betray the cause. You you you're not respectful of the victims. You um, and so on. And that's an important voice, and it has to be listened to in a in a pluralistic discourse of transitional justice. It's not about erasing voices. It's about giving them a space, but at the same time, thinking about um, sort of. Accepting, as I said, that uh, that for instance, you talked about Ukraine now, and what is interesting—it's not not my topic at all, and I'm not an expert in it at all—but was interesting to see Habermas, for instance, uh, wrote an article in in uh, in the Frankfurter Zeitung, Allgemeine Zeitung, not in the uh, arguing that compromises have to be made, and then and you could immediately see that compromise is really a, a an explosive word. People feel that uh, and. And I think it is. It is. It is. When you when you deal with extreme injustices, how could you ever make compromises with those people who are responsible for that? You know? So I think that a pluralist discourse has to take into account exactly that. So it's not about being triumphalist about you know what what pluralists are saying. They are they accept the reality of compromise and of, of conflicts, but at the same same time speak a language of humility that's what i meant mm -hmm. and now maybe for an example yeah. to make this a bit more plausible so in the book i, I discuss quite extensively south africa for obvious reasons <laughs> and i speak a lot about a figure which is quite unknown um, um joe slovo joe slovo was a communist leader in south africa was for a long time uh, in exile uh, in london wrote a book in the, in the 80s, No Compromise, you know, <laughs> saying no compromise with the apartheid regime, comes back in the 90s, um, is really one of the leading voices and starts a debate in South Africa in the communist journal saying what room for compromise. And that was a really, that was a scandal for the communist party. I mean, people had suffered in this party. They wanted now change. They wanted victims to be respected and what does a does a leader do? He he actually calls for um for compromise. And in, in, in that article, Slovo said two things. He said, in order to move where we want to move, compromises are necessary. 
So, and where do we want people to move? We want to move to a full democratic society, and we want to move there, not in 20 years, we want to move there in a couple of years. And the second thing he said, we must make a difference between qualitative and quantitative compromises. Quantitative compromises are not interesting because they're technical, they're okay. Qualitative compromises are linked to values. And here we have to discuss. And he said, for slow words, it's clear that he would support any compromise which would not undermine the ultimate aim of creating in short term, mm. mid term, uh, um, a truly democratic society in South Africa. That was his. That was his. That was the limit to compromises, and that that um, that proposal was actually accepted by Mandela. Mandela mentions it in his in his writings and and. Um, they end, and part of that of that deal, part of the compromise was also the shoot commission um, yeah. with the am conditional amnesty, of course. That was all in the sunset clauses. And they ended up um, with, with a power sharing regime first, mm. which was also part of this, this mm. compromise, sharing power with the national party, mm. and then ending up with uh, you know majority government by, by Mandela. Mm. And um, so now we could say. Where is South Africa today? Yes. You know, you could say uh, an equal society is uh, probably the deal was not that good. You know, that's what some people say. Uh, the, the problem of the deal, I don't think that that's the problem. I think that compromises have to be seen not as once for all decisions, but they have to be seen as social pacts. Mm -hmm. And the social pact is negotiated constantly. Mm -hmm. Like our social pacts, you know, we have we, we are renegotiating social pacts all the time in our societies. Mm -hmm. and I think the same has to be thought about this transitional justice compromise. So a compromise which was made maybe in the nineties mm -hmm. might not be valid anymore. Mm -hmm. It can be challenged, mm -hmm. and roads must fall. Mm -hmm. Two thousand sixteen can be seen as a certain you know, demand for um, radical change. Yeah, can you explain Africa. a little bit what roads yeah, must fall? Roads must fall. Uh, probably you have to be following uh, in South African campuses this um, actually against the statute from from colonialism roads uh, that this that this um, the statute should be put down. Huh? Mm -hmm. But it was actually also about you know, decolonizing education and mm -hmm. and um, also starting a discussion about um, structural mm -hmm. racism in, in education, and uh, it moved over to to, to Oxford. Mm -hmm. And really moved also this discussion is also part of my, my book, mm -hmm. because one part of the book is um, value pluralism, but the other is also cultural pluralism. How did you, because it's when you started the book, and I remember also back in the days, mm -hmm. the question of colonialization, mm -hmm. uh, of dealing with the colonial past was not part of the transitional mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. landscape at all. Right. No? So it was basically... Like, like left out com completely. You no, know? we looked into violations of the nineties, mainly okay. you know, Yugoslavia, uh, this 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 recent context. So something that goes back longer, we didn't, we didn't address. How how did it find a way in your book? I don't know if, if you remember, but we had a class. Um, we had a, a year which was very much uh, driven by this decolonizing uh, discussion. Yeah, and we had students in our master program saying. You know, actually, when you look at the program, 90% uh, of the writers are from the West. Um, also, the concepts are from the West. Is that is that the, are you teaching us the Western concept? Or uh, is that also interesting from people from Africa, for instance, or from other parts of the world? Or are you just imposing on us your ideas? And uh, I first reacted a bit defensively, you know, as we usually do when we're not sure of ourselves. <laughs> and and then uh, with my with my um, assistant and friend, um, Tafatsa, Christmas at the Fatsa from, from Zimbabwe, we, we started having this discussion. And, and I had to realize that there's also a need in transitional justice to decolonize, yeah. to ask what is the place of the local in, in our discussions? You know, what is, um, for instance, an example, a um, special rapporteur talking about cultural interventions in 2015, I mm -hmm. think. And, you know, mentioning only things we, we consider here in the West as high culture or theaters. Uh, museums and 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 then you wonder is that really of importance to people on the ground and and then i read for instance about peru uh, after years of conflict there has been this german initiative to create a, a museum for memory huh? museo de la memoria 
and uh, no one actually goes there in a, in a good job because it's not in, doesn't interest them. They're interested in festivals, perhaps. You know, so I think then the question becomes: there are norms. Norms might be important. You might share them, but there are also rituals. Mm. You know? And I, I, you can very well think of a, of a courtroom, for instance, as a ritual, mm -hmm. which makes very well, very good sense in a certain culture, perhaps. You know, when I go to Venezuela, my wife works sometimes, and you have this, this impression of a court of right and wrong, uh, evil and bad, evil and good, and uh, Christian overtones. You, you understand this is really it's part of our culture. And then you wonder, in, in a context where perhaps courtroom were oppressive, they were used in an oppressive way. They were there was a place where actually people in South Africa, for instance, where people were actually you know, that was really the place of oppression. Mm -hmm. So can we really hope? Can we put so much hope in those institutions that they will bring change? Mm -hmm. And I think these are legitimate questions, you know. And uh, so asking, having a certain openness to perhaps other ways of doing these things mm -hmm. to other standpoints, I think seems to be a very important part. And But I think there are two, I would, in the book, I argue that there are two extremes which, which I would avoid, which I think find a bit dangerous. So the one is to romanticize the local. The local is never, is never a, a guarantee for emancipation or a non-oppressive way. It's not at all. The local has to be criticized. It's not good because so not just because something is local, it's good or progressive. Or... And the other is, um, I think, an, a very strict adherence to legal standards, mm -hmm. rule of law standards, and to say this is the only way. It's a discussion we saw in Rwanda with the Gachata courts. You can say many things about Gachata. You can say they were manipulated by the government. You can say there was a double agenda. You can say many things. But just to say these proceedings were not in line with Western standards of fairness seems to me a little bit um, an easy way to, 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 to treat diversity. Mm -hmm. I think we should be open to local mechanisms which interpret the rule of law differently. Mm -hmm. if, if the value of the rule of law is respected and the value of the rule of law, I think it might be, might be said to be universal if you think about it as a, the prevention of the arbitrary. And if we have, in another place, ways of dealing with the rule of law in this way, I think there should be some openness to this. Otherwise, we end up having this idea that there's a one-sided imposition of Western standards to, to other countries, and we will not have this. And I, I think, yeah, that's, that's what we want. Let's, at the end of our conversation, come back to, the, to this picture of the, of the fox and the hedgehog. No? I mean... Uh, who trumps the other? When one reads your book, it seems like that you bring in the fox back into the conversation. So you push out the hedgehog. Is that like this? Or what do you, how do you, do you uh, reconcile? How do you negotiate between the two of them? Or do you negotiate between the two of them? Um, so I think I started with an idea, you know, this sort of a division between the hedgehog and the fox. And the more I worked on it, the more I realized that they're actually complementary. And I really believe that the, the, the fox needs a hedgehog to be fox. That's the last, that's the last question I, I, I asked, but I really, really think so. I think that a discourse of rights and discourse, a victim-centered discourse is, is as important as a discourse about what conditions do we need to create the possibility for justice, you know? So these two discourses are, are interlinked, I think, and in a sense, the fox needs a hedgehog to be a fox. <laughs> Very good. I think we stop here and we have already half an hour and we think we move to to the to our Hedgehog and who came all the way from Bern uh, to, to be with us today. And so I think I we just automatically hand over. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Swiss Peace and the Universal and Medica for organizing this meeting. Um, I will go in two steps because one of my colleagues who was supposed to be here today, he's senior advisor advising bilateral context or working on the bilateral level uh, on transitional justice. Um, he had to go on a, on a mission that was not planned and he shared some words with me, which I would like to read out to you today. And, and I will complement with some personal impressions. His name is Nicola de Torrente. 
Many thanks to Frank Haldeman for this stimulating, enjoyable, and relevant read. I really regret not being with you to discuss being with you to discuss it. From afar, I just wanted to share one main reflection with you about the major theme of the book. The image of the hedgehog and fox is persuasive and it allows for meaningful insights. However, as practitioners who are not directly leading, implementing transitional justice processes, but accompanying, supporting, encouraging them, we find ourselves in a somewhat of a persistent fox-hedgehog dilemma. On the one hand, it is clear that the only TJ transitional justice processes that can deliver results are those that are fox-like, adapted to the needs, constraints, opportunities of the context. The product of a political negotiation among different values and interests and developed in an iterative, progressive and flexible manner. Imposition or importation of a hedgehog formula or blueprints won't work. To take an example from the situation I'm currently working on, the Sudan, I just read the Juba Peace Agreement, a breakthrough deal which was concluded in October 2020 between the transitional Sudanese government and a series of armed groups from the periphery like Darfur and Kordofan. The agreement contains a lot of nice sounding commitments to justice, accountability, reconciliation, reparations, etc. Just for Darfur, it sets up a whole range of institutions, a true for the reconciliations committee, a special court, a traditional justice mechanism and the reparations fund, all to be established within 60 to 90 days of signing the agreement and moreover with ambitious, unclear, overlapping mandates. Two and a half years on, needless to say that nothing at all has been implemented. As far as I heard, the delegations didn't really discuss these provisions or write the text, but there were helpful international particip participants who provided assistance. A clear tick the box hedgehog type intervention. On the other hand, there are some lessons from experience. Some general areas and principles that should be taken into account in dealing with the past processes. To leave them aside could mean opening the door for the many who reject or resist transitional justice for a variety of reasons. In parentheses, this aspect is downplayed or underestimated in the book, which talks of transitional justice as a generally uncontested phenomenon being applied across the world, whereas in fact, there are far more places where dealing with the past would be useful, but is not done due to opposing political interests, or where ongoing dealing with the past processes are being resisted and undermined. Going hyper fox and overly, dis overly focusing on the complexities, the conflicts of values and interests, the trade offs and the difficulties could lead either to paralysis or to flawed or incomplete processes. For instance, in the name of realistic adaptation to the context, impunity could be maintained while victims are paid off with promises of reparations as it is being attempted in Sri Lanka, but fortunately resisted by the victims. So a degree of normative and programmatic guidance is inevitable, and I would argue necessary when we give courses or act to provide, and we are when we give courses or are asked to provide advice, when we try to promote action at the multilateral level. When we try to make the case that dealing with the past has an important role to play in prevention and so on. The challenge is to consider dealing with the past framework as a starting point, a guide for a framework for discussion in order to pragmatically shape and find compromises in what essentially 
is a political process. Many thanks to Frank Haldeman for making us well aware of this challenge with this book, its appeal to pluralism and its powerful thinking like a fox imagery. And we look forward to continuing this discussion, hopefully next time in person. So these are the words from Wendelin Nicolas. Uh, from my side, uh, also, I would like to, to thank you very much, Frank, um, for this very thought-provoking book for me, too. And as I said, I would like to share some points from the perspective of what I would call a generalist in the field of transitional justice. Um, as a diplomat, subject to what we call the transfer discipline of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, which means that we change posting every four years. I work at the task force for now some months. I joined it in August, 2022. And I am in charge of multilateral aspects of this work. And for the sake of Weber's neutral axiology, <laughs> Let me mention that my comments are the ones of a newbie in the field uh, and mainly working at headquarters. As you discussed it very well in your book, the multilateral environment has been producing language and norms, which since the early 2000s have framed the work of the international community. Our work. Switzerland considers itself to have been actively involved in shaping this normative framework. Example be given by, the create, by creating the mandate of the special, special rapporteur that you have cited several times, and also by um, co-writing and co-initiating uh, the first resolution of the Human Rights Council on Human Rights and Transitional Justice. So in your book, you discuss this 2004 report of the Secretary General on the rule of law and how it set up this normal model in the early 2000s. And interestingly, it took until 2020 for the Security Council to hold the first open debate on transitional justice based on a Belgian initi initiative. And uh, the main objective of this debate was to have the Council adopt the first resolution on transitional justice. As we all know, this was not, this, there was no consensus for this resolution to be adopted and the project did not succeed. So what I see from a newcomer perspective indeed is that transitional justice is quite well established in Geneva in the human rights debate but it still struggles to enter the peace building debate in New York. And since I entered this field last year, I do observe strong resistances against this topic or within the debate. Maybe they are linked to what you call the midlife crisis. <laughs> uh, but what I do observe is that the multilateral seal is, in general is more and more polarized not only with regards to transitional justice. There is a growing pressure on core values associated to what we call the Western style liberal democracy. My point is not to say whether this resistance is positive or negative, but I can say that Switzerland has entered the Security Council in a very challenging um, time. <laughs> From my understanding, your book encourages us to constructively tackle these value conflicts. But me also being a bit realistic, I must admit that it seems to be nowadays a very challenging task to challenge these dominant narratives. And you have mentioned the Ukraine debate just before. I wonder how can we in the current, in this current context, open space for pluralistic perspectives and concluding with this question and personal challenge for my everyday work, uh, I would like to thank Swiss Peace. Uh, I would like to thank the Union of Basel. And I would really like to thank you, Frank Haldeman and Thomas Unger, for, for giving us the chance to be part of this discussion, uh, to connecting also with the academic environment for us as practitioners. And I hope 
the conversation will continue after this event. Good pleasure. <laughs>